I am Ihe Tongwan Dakota, and I'm Two Spirit. So a lot of my work is around Indigenous well-being, uh, especially with like LGBTQ Two Spirit people, uh, protecting them, and also sort of like bettering the health of Indigenous communities and Indigenous individuals. I got my um, undergrad degree in psychology and English. Uh, and then now I do a master's degree in cross-cultural psychology. I am writing my thesis about how sovereignty impacts Indigenous communities' mental health. I want to get my PhD and I want to go into clinical psychology, but I want to be a narrative therapist for Indigenous people, like in particular. And I really want to sort of like design, um, like in psychology, you would say peer delivered healthcare, which is basically just a fancier word for teaching people that don't have to have a bunch of degrees, like how they can help other people in their community or how they can help each other. Uh, my first year, actually, I went to college and I knew right away that I really wanted to meet other Indigenous people. And I wanted to like form a student organization with them. Uh, but there's not a lot of Indigenous people <laughs> in college campuses in the U.S. a lot of times. I spent like my first year at college trying to make any connection I could to other Indigenous people. And yeah, it was really difficult though. Um, not only do you have to find 10 Indigenous people, but then find 10 Indigenous people who have like the time and the ability to actively be in this like organization and make these events and apply for funding. It was a lot of work. We worked really hard to get this organization started. And it essentially is like a indigenous and Native American rights organization. And it's open not only to indigenous people, but also to allies. And we organize like educational events. We organize like art projects. Um, we had round tables. We had the first ever all indigenous uh, panel at my school. Yeah, it was really great, but at the same time, it was really difficult because it was really a struggle to keep it going and to keep people interested in it that were not indigenous. It's still continuing now, which I'm really proud of. Now there's another indigenous person running it. There's actually two indigenous people who are co-leading it together. Um, and they just brought Deb Haland to talk at my school, which is pretty cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's really cool to see something that you started a couple of years ago and you really fought to start, like have a life of its own and have people that are still interested in it and still are keeping it going. So I'm really proud of that. Like one of the biggest obstacles I think I and really most Indigenous people face is just the huge lack of representation. Um, across all fields. Like it doesn't matter what kind of field you work in. There's just no representation because people don't really know who indigenous people truly are. Like they have no real idea of what indigeneity looks like or how indigenous people are in the present day. I met this really amazing woman. Her name is Marcella Gilbert and she was really active in the No Dakota Access Pipeline protests. She ran all the food distribution there and she ran this community garden in La Plante. Um, and I was working like with a nonprofit that partnered with the community to run this garden. And I got to hear her talk and she was just so awesome. And then I realized that she was going to be in a film about her and her mother, um, whose name is Madonna Thunderhawk and she's amazing also. <laughs> um, she was really active in the American Indian movement in the 70s. And when I found out that the film was being made and it had been finished and was now being distributed, I really wanted to bring it to DC and have it screened there. But, so it's being screened there, but before we had like a really personal discussion with um, Madonna and Marcella and the director of the film, whose name was Elizabeth Castle, and we brought them to our campus. And I was so excited about it, you know, like it had been really hard to get the funding and to arrange like the flights and the accommodation for them and to get them to come and like prepare questions. And literally only three people showed up. 
I felt horrible. I felt so guilty. And I felt like I had really failed because I was like, I must have done something wrong. You know, I just brought three amazing women to this campus and no one cares. <laughs> like no one wants to hear what they have to say. There's so many stereotypes about, you know, how indigenous people look and like what they're supposed to say and do. And it, like, it just ends up silencing so many indigenous people, especially black indigenous people, especially, you know, indigenous people that aren't native American, like people that are out from outside of the US and people that are not like Plains tribes or like Eastern tribes, because I think those are the most stereotyped when you think about indigenous people. Yeah, it's really difficult. Like I had never met an indigenous person that had like a master's or a PhD until I was in college. And when I did meet someone, like I basically begged her to become my mentor because she was amazing. And like, she's still my mentor today. We still talk. Yeah, there's just not representation in any field for Indigenous people, really. I think that the main way is just by like seeking out and really putting in the work to make and sustain like long term strong relationships. I think that being Indigenous is really about like community and about your family um, and obviously like our concepts of family go way beyond just like your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, like it's really extended. And I really apply that to like the work I do. I don't think that it's, it's just my work. Like it's a lot of people's work that comes together to like speak on topics that are indigenous or speak on like indigenous knowledge, getting to meet other people who you like share a lot of background with, whether it's ancestrally or just like life experience is awesome. It's important to be optimistic, like about the future, definitely. Um, but it's also okay to be angry and like pessimistic in a way because that also is valid and like drives people's work, I think. And also it means being able to be critical of yourself and to reflect on your actions and to realize that there's always more to learn um, and like how valuable everyone's voice is, especially when it's like indigenous people. You have to elevate like these marginalized voices, being in a position to speak and like in a position of privilege where you can be the person speaking and you can be the person doing like activism work doesn't mean that you should be the only person talking. It just means that you should be like the person fighting to have the people who can't have the same platform to have their voices heard. Just the most important part about like activism is not really viewing it as activism in a way, like it's viewing it as this like call, like I said, to build relationships with people and to build representation. It's, yeah, I think it's important to be validated, like no matter how you feel, especially if you're like a black person or an indigenous person or a person of color, like like the space to feel what you feel and however you feel is usually what drives the work that you do.